right, so my story's gonna be a little different from what we've heard so far. Um, just big picture, we've had Dr. Wall, cell cell adhesion, talking about how things interact, right? We've had Dr. Beatty share his work on facial prosthetics and making things better, and Dr. Bennett talking about his work in digital dentistry. And I think all of those seem very different, but a striking similarity that I come back to is that they were all just asking a question, right? And then creating this good long story about where to go from there and how to ask future questions and how to further dissect what they know and what they want to know. So my pathway is a little different because I don't have a streamlined pathway like the others before me. My training was exclusively in genetics research, so oftentimes when people see me here in this building, I'm an anatomist, and you know me only as an anatomist because that's what I talk about most of the time. But my training was very different, and my experience in research is very different from what I do today. So my goal today is to share a, a series of short stories, meaning that I'm going to share with you my genetics research, which again is different than what I do now, but I think is foundational in creating me as a re researcher and then my ability to to translate the skills that I acquired through my training into different uh, formats. So I'll talk a little bit about my educational research that I'm diving into now and some side projects that I've done along the way. And hopefully you see consistency again in asking questions and in dissecting your question into components and figuring out how you're going to solve, solve the problem. So, series of short stories, not to discount the value of it, but to give perspective that we're going to hop around a little bit. But I hope to share uh, the lessons that I learned through those and hopefully shed light on your ability to translate what you're learning now and what you do now into different genres as you go. So we got to back up all the way to my undergrad days when there was absolutely no way I was going to go into academia. Absolutely not interested. I was going to be a physician. That was my career pathway. My vision of academia, and especially academic researchers, was this. Uh, lonely lab, one person knowing all the things. No one else could even converse because the person knew all the things, right? Very lonely. Isolated both in that sense, but also physically isolated. Being kept in one lab seems entirely different than what I wanted to do with my future. Always stressed about funding, this is true, we're going to come back to this, but I was terrified of writing grants all the time and being so dependent on external financing and all of that, I was terrified. Um, I was a little biased because I had had several instructors, especially in undergrad days, that just hated teaching and it was very obvious that they didn't really care about teaching. They were there for their research and they were required to teach whatever genetic, your, you know, whatever the basic found or science class was. So I was afraid that the teaching part of things would go off to the distance and I would never become a teacher like I had envisioned someday I could do. Imposter syndrome is real. I still don't feel smart enough to be where I am here, but I was very afraid of asking questions and being told I was wrong. And that's a vulnerability that you learn over time. And I'm very comfortable with being wrong now. I'm wrong often. And I tell the students I make mistakes all the time. So uh, I just was fearful of taking that risk of putting myself somewhere where I would be called out for not knowing what I didn't know. Uh, I was afraid the work was going to be monotonous and I knew I wasn't going to be motivated to do the same thing every day. All of this made it seem like academic research was not for me. So. I was pre-med, going through undergrad, thinking I'm going to meet the requirements to go to medical school. Well, sophomore year, I took a genetics class with Dr. Harshman and loved the genetics class. And I was also in the honors program and knew I had to create an honors thesis, which I decided I was going to do in genetics. So he took me on in his lab to work in his genetics lab. I knew nothing about genetics labs, no idea what he did. I had no idea, but I was like, yeah, I can do genetics research. So with that, I took on this project that happened to be Drosophila related. Who has done fruit fly work before? It is terrible. I hate it. I hate it. I thought it was disgusting, but I signed on for this, so I was going to do it. So here's labs and these racks of Drosophila. These are all fruit flies in these little containers, and part of my job was to maintain the stocks and help create these different lines, and then I would CO2 gun or ether them to knock them out, 
put them under a microscope and then sex them, separate males and females, because we did a lot of studies with mating. So I needed to separate the females before they had a chance to mate to get virgin females. To do that, I would use this mouth aspirator, which is one of the main things I hated. You stick the mouth part in and then you suck it up, hope the mesh is in there so you don't end up with them in your mouth. That's how you suck them up and you put them on these plates under the microscope. Think of how tiny a fruit fly is, right? Super teeny. Suck them up, put them under that plate. And what we were interested in in Dr. Hirschman's lab was investigating the transcriptome of what's called our sperm storage organs within Drosophila. So not specific to Drosophila, but a number of species have these sperm storage organs that uh, contain sperm, so after mating, to allow for prolonged fertilization, right? So as more mature eggs are released, more sperm can be released from these sperm storage organs, spermatheca is one of those, to uh, kind of prolong that reproductive period. So what we were interested in is identifying the gene regulation of how these uh, sperm storage organs were acting, what gene expressions were um, altered in different lines, and then how the gene expression was varied at different points of the reproductive cycle. So by separating virgin females from males, we could then mate the male and female and then uh, take different time points, so post-mating, three hours, six hours, etc. So I would do the matings, and then I would isolate the female afterwards, and then at different time points, I would then dissect out the sex, uh, the sperm storage organs from those under the microscope here, and then do analysis. So RNA extraction, a whole lot of microarrays, a whole lot of real-time PCR, etc. So lots of data collected from this, and I spent probably two years doing this work. It was awesome because I learned, A, so much about the projects, but B, I was able to contribute in a lot of ways to a couple different projects. So these are the two main papers that came out of it, but I was also able to complete that honors thesis and was able to be pretty proud of what I put together from that experience. So what did I learn aside from the actual science of what I did? One, the hundreds of hours it takes to get to the very beginning of a project. I was no, I had no idea how much work went into getting to the point of being able to do the actual data analysis. So that was a big thing for me. I learned I had hand skills. Uh, dissecting the little sperm storage organs from little fruit flies was a very tedious task, and I did thousands of them. And so I learned how to do very nice dissection, uh, you know, things, which has obviously helped me very much as an anatomist now. I learned to do the thing you're dreading first, and I still do that today. I hated making the fly media. We were too cheap to buy anything pre-made. So I had to get out the huge vat, water, yeast, maple syrup, which I can still not eat maple syrup to this day. It grosses me out. I hated doing it, so I would do it first thing in the morning. When I had to show up, I did it first, so I got it out of the way and didn't think about it anymore. Today, I hate draining the cadaver tanks. Literally hate doing it, but I do it first thing in the morning to get it done with, and then I don't have to think about it anymore. So it taught me to do something that I didn't want to do first to get it out of the way and clear my mental space for something else. Most importantly, this work in the genetics lab taught me to assert myself. And this comes back to the papers that I just showed. I don't know if you noticed, but my name is not on those papers. I was not an author. I was not acknowledged at any point of that project for my work. So to me, at that point, I was still pre-med, right? So I had no idea what authorship would even mean to me. I didn't know to assert myself, to put myself in a place to get authorship on those papers. And this is just a little bit of information. Um, I can share this with you if you want. But there's a lot of discrepancies between authorship rights, both within specialties, but also across different disciplines. You'll see that some papers have two authors. You'll see some papers that have hundreds of authors, right? So there's a very big range of who decides what is important and what is worthy of authorship on papers. But it made me dive into this a little bit more now to think how much did I contribute to that work and now knowing that I should have fought a little bit more for, for some acknowledgement on those papers. Obviously the amount of evidence, data collection, and the experiments that I performed to me seemed worthy of authorship. So I'm mad at myself now for not recognizing that and not putting myself in a position to get authorship on those papers. But the lesson learned for this, especially for the students, if you are having a mentor 
that conversation should start from the very beginning. What is expected from the mentor in terms of what you can dedicate to that project, whether they see you as a contributor to something that will come from it, like a manuscript, that's just something to have from day one. So I've learned from this experience that that conversation should happen long before you get to the actual manuscript writing phase of things. Okay, at this point, I am now a senior in undergrad. Still was thinking about medical school, but I had a number of things that was making me realize that maybe medical school wasn't a for sure thing for me. Number one, I really enjoyed the genetics research. I really enjoyed what I was doing and thought that it was productive and made me feel like I was using science. I was helping people in a more indirect way, but I saw myself as a researcher for the first time, which I'd never seen myself as before. That was big for me. I was also working part-time as a pharmacy tech, so I worked about 20 hours a week through undergrad as a pharmacy tech to pay my bills because the fruit flies didn't do it. So working both of those jobs make me, made me realize like, I liked pharmacy as well. I was not so tuned in to this idea of going to medical school. So opening all these doors make, really just gave me cold feet. <laughs> made me say, do I really want to go into medicine? Is that really what I want to do? I was so focused on what and not who I wanted to be. So all of this uh, cold feet situation led me to explore other options. And that brought me to UNMC Omaha for the genetics, cell biology, and anatomy program. I thought if I did a master's, that would buy me like a year or two, right? Where I can just get more experience. It's only going to help me wherever I end up, whether it's medicine or pharmacy or research, wherever I go, it was only going to help me, but it was buying me more time to figure out exactly what I wanted to do from there. So I went to interview for genetic cell biology and anatomy in the master's program, met with a couple different people. Before I met with Karen, met with a faculty member who, I have to tell you the story, when he was interviewing, interviewing me, he asked about my college experience, which was a normal college experience, but I also worked 20 hours a week in a genetics lab and 20 hours a week as a pharmacy tech. So I had told him I was mating fruit flies and passing out pills, and that's what I did. And he said, okay, I guess that's one way to get sex and drugs in college. <laughs> <laughs> which is totally ridiculous, but that's what he said. I can't make this stuff up. Anyway, uh, which to me was kind of funny and kind of like broke the ice with this experience and made me see these researchers in a very lighthearted way. So I, I took that as a good thing. But my last meeting of the day was with Dr. Karen Gould, who is a saint. I'm going to come back to her a number of times. But she and I hit it off, mostly because I was so intimidated by her. I was terrified of her. She was so brilliant and articulate and well put together and methodical and type A in every way that I'm type B, just such a stark contrast for me. And I just, I couldn't get over the fact that she was who I wanted to be. She was the role model that I was seeking in this lost, what am I doing with my life phase of my life. So I really connected with her and I shared with her my honors thesis work, which again was genetics, some hormone signaling, some gene regulation stuff and learned that her lab, one of her main focuses was investigating the impact of estrogen receptor alpha signaling on lupus development and progression. So main things here, genetics, hormone signaling, disease, all of the things that you know spoke to me from my experience. So she was willing to take me on. She had just gotten a couple R01s and had funding and was like, yes, come work for me. No real commitment. Again, at this point it was still masters. So I was like, yes, I can do this. If I would have had parents who would have supported me to go travel Europe for a year, I would not be here. I would have been in Europe and then who knows where else. But this was where my next step was going to lead, and I think it was meant to be. Okay, for my actual <laughs> genetics research, which is what I'm going to share with you for this next chapter book, if you will, we're going to talk about lupus. So just a little bit about lupus to get us into the actual uh, research that I did. Lupus is a chronic autoimmune disease, which is characterized by a loss of tolerance to nuclear antigens, leading to the production of anti-nuclear autoantibodies. So what does that all mean? It means it's an autoimmune disease where you lose tolerance to yourself. You start producing anti-chromatin, anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies, which then lead to this, leads to this immune complex deposition. So these immune complexes start depositing into different tissues, and that leads to vasculitis, pericarditis, pleura, uh, inflammation, right? Inflammation in the whole body. 
It's a chronic inflammatory response, which then leads to tissue damage from all of that deposition into the tissues where it's not supposed to be. So there's a few different types of lupus, but 70% of all lupus diagnoses are systemic lupus erythematosus, which again is just a systemic presentation of this inflammatory response. Most importantly, one of the major consequences is glomerulonephritis, where those immune complexes deposit in the kidneys, which leads to kidney failure and uh, obviously subsequent death. Oh, I should mention here, one of the presentations for patients with systemic lupus erythematosus is what's called the malar rash. Before we called it the zygomatic bone, we called it the malar bone, which just means cheek. So one of the main presentations we see in these patients is this nice rash across the cheek. Overall, there's about 11 criteria that are used to diagnose lupus because it's not just the rash. It's not just kidney disease. There's a lot of different presentations, and so you're diagnosed based on kind of checking the boxes to a number of those things. We don't know what causes lupus, but we know that the development is multifactorial, meaning that we know there's both genetics and environmental triggers involved. So in the genetic side, we recognize a concordance rate being high in monozygomatic twins. So if you have identical twins, the rate at which both of them are going to have it is anywhere between 25 and 70 percent, depending on what literature you're using. There's also high heritability between first degree relatives. So both of those suggest there's a good, strong genetic component. It's not 100 percent, right? So we don't know that it's strictly genetic, but we know that there's some genetics uh, contributing to this. We also know environmental triggers, and those are including UV light, hormones, both endogenous hormones, so um, triggers during pregnancy or the menstrual cycle, but also certain medications, and mostly those that are tied to disturbing the normal hormone uh, regulation. So again, patients are diagnosed on a cumulative presentation of these, and all of our treatment options are pretty terrible. They're either immune suppression or treating the individual um, you know, symptoms, but not really comprehensive. So our goal is to better understand how lupus pathogenesis occurs so that we can better treat it. What's most striking about lupus is that 90 to 95 percent of lupus patients are female. So there's a striking sex bias to this. And given that, we know that not only is there a female sex bias, but that it's specific to women of childbearing age. So between puberty and menopause is where we see the most diagnosed uh, patients uh, dealing with lupus. This leads us to suspect estrogen, which is our main female sex hormone, playing a role in this autoimmunity. We know estrogen functions a normal immune response, but it's also tied to autoimmunity. So we've known that uh, estrogen can increase flares, like I mentioned during both the menstrual cycle and pregnancy, that exo exogenous estrogens can also increase the lupus risk, and that genetic disturbances like Klinefelter syndrome, where a male has two X's plus a Y, they have increased serum estradiol, and they're also prone to developing lupus. So all of this leads us to think about estrogen. So in order to study lupus, we need to first dissect the background of the estrogen, right? So here we're looking at a mouse model called uh, NZB, NZW, F1, so New Zealand black, New Zealand white, F1. And that mouse line very closely emulates what we see in human disease because these mice lose tolerance to nuclear antigens. They produce a whole lot of autoantibodies and they have this glomerulonephritis that eventually kills most of them. Most importantly, this mouse line also demonstrates that female sex bias. So it very closely represents what we see in human lupus, so it serves as a really good mouse model to study lupus. So the first studies are looking at how does estrogen contribute to disease progression in this lupus-prone mouse line. So this first work done by Wu and colleagues back in 2000 was looking at administering tamoxifen, which is an anti-estrogen, to the mice in this NZB, NZW, F1 mouse line. So what, we, what they did was inject the controls, which is peanut oil, the experimental group with tamoxifen to antagonize the normal function of estrogen. And what they saw was that over time, those who had this anti-estrogen administered, they're going to live longer. So you see a significant difference here between the control group that all died by a year of age versus those treated with tamoxifen. So prolonged survival, which suggests that interfering with estrogen is going to lead to prolonged survival. The next step was by Lee and McMurray in 2007, 
where instead of antagonizing with tamoxifen, now we're going to use some specific agonists to trigger more hormone action. So for this, we have to recognize that estrogen signaling relies on two different receptors, estrogen receptor alpha and beta. There's some others as well, but those are the big two. So estrogen receptor alpha and beta rely on estrogen binding, and then uh, I'm not going to go through the details of the signaling, but right, a hormone binding to the receptor, translocating to the nucleus, plugging into an estrogen response element, and either promoting gene expression or alternatively splicing the genes, all of these things. So this next step then was to take PPT or DPN. PPT is an agonist specific for estrogen receptor alpha, whereas DPN is an agonist specific for beta. So in giving these two agonists to these ovaryectomized mice, we look at their prolonged survival and notice that our controls are still dying by a year of age. But those who were given specifically the PPT, the estrogen receptor alpha agonist, died much earlier. So this suggests that not only is estrogen playing a role or in synergizing with the genetics to accelerate death, but it's specifically signaling through estrogen receptor alpha, not beta. Okay, next work by Dr. Gould, who I will eventually join in the lab, she wanted to look at the signaling specifically through estrogen receptor alpha to promote that disease presentation. So here we're using estrogen receptor alpha knockout mice. So now we're messing up the estrogen receptor alpha signaling to see what happens with the disease progression. Compared to our control mice that, again, all die pretty early, our estrogen receptor alpha knockout mice here have prolonged survival. So they, again, that suggests that estrogen signaling through estrogen receptor alpha is what's accelerating disease. Similarly, those who are estrogen receptor alpha knockout are going to have less glomerular nephritis. So the kidney immune deposition is less, so they're going to live longer and live a little bit happier. When we look at that, we tie that to their anti double stranded DNA autoantibody production, and we see both a decrease at an early time point and a later time point in the amount of autoantibodies they're producing. And that again corresponds with the deposition in the kidney. So here's a very sad glomerular nephritis uh, kidney. There's immune complex depositions, hypercellularity in the glomeruli, just sad, sad kidneys. Here's the estrogen receptor knockout kidneys, very happy kidneys, not nearly as uh, destroyed by that disease progression. So again, this is highlighting the work of estrogen signaling through estrogen receptor alpha promoting disease. Okay, so our next step then was to better identify the genetic component to this. We already know estrogen is playing a role. Estrogen receptor alpha is uh, responsible for it. So we want to better identify what specific genetic interval is playing a role in this NCV NCW F1 maestro. So one specific interval called SLE1 is associated with disease progression both in the mouse model and in humans. So by making a congenic mice strand that had SLE1 on a control background, we can better identify the impact of just that small interval on disease progression. What was interesting is the analysis of these SLE1 mice revealed that SLE1 on its own produced the whole lupus pathogenesis. It was responsible for all that would be to follow with autoimmunity. So that led us to think more about how can we look specifically at this SLE1 interval and the interplay, the synergy with estrogen receptor signaling. This led to my master's program. That was all background, I'm sorry, but it will make sense why I had to explain all of that. So here's what we knew. Lupus patients were female, estrogen's playing a role. We know that this interval called SLE1 is responsible for all that will be uh, lupus pathogenesis and especially noting that this SLE1 mice line have the female sex bias. So it seems like a great model for us to knock out estrogen signaling and see if the SLE1 is what's interplaying with estrogen to produce what we see in lupus. So my task was to understand the mechanisms through which estrogen receptor alpha synergizes with SLE1 to promote the loss of tolerance to help us better understand how estrogens are going to impact those genetically controlled pathways. So to do this, my hypothesis was that estrogen was doing this and that it was signaling through estrogen receptor alpha to promote lupus. 
So my job for my master's was to intercross this estrogen receptor alpha knockout strain with the SLE1 congenic mice to then look at the impact of estrogen receptor alpha deficiency on disease progression. So I need to measure the loss of tolerance, the immune cell hyperactivation, and then the gene expression within the SLE1 interval. Because we know that estrogen and estrogen receptor alpha is impacting gene expression, we said maybe it's as simple as this signaling triggering something at the, you know, the genetic uh, gene expression level. So we identified some candidate genes within that interval that we knew play a role in the immune system and looked specifically at those. So this is what we will eventually publish as this paper. And what we looked at first, again, is that loss of tolerance. So are the mice who have estrogen receptor signaling knocked out, are they less likely to lose tolerance? Or do they live longer without those symptoms? So look, what you can see here is that in our control mice, the estrogen receptor alpha wild type, about 80% of them are going to lose tolerance. Heterozygosity doesn't really affect it, but what you see here is that the knockout mice have much less autoantibody production, so they are less likely to lose tolerance and develop those autoantibodies. In a parallel study, we would do ovaryectomies on the mice, so dissect out the ovaries, a sham procedure on the other, just expose the ovaries, put them back in. And what we see in the mice who had their ovaries taken out, which takes out all endogenous estrogen production, same thing, 33% in both of these cases where there's a significant reduction in that loss of tolerance. So what this means is that not only is estrogen playing a role, but removing estrogen receptor alpha signaling out of the picture was the same as taking out estrogens altogether. So to this, this was emphasizing again that it was not estrogen receptor beta or some other membrane estrogen receptor, it was alpha that was playing a role in this. So that emphasized our work in alpha knockouts. Same thing with looking at our anti-double-stranded DNA production, knockout produced a lot less. Next step was to look at our immune cell hyperactivation. We know that lupus patients have hyperactive immune cells, right? So now we're looking at, that was all ELISA data before, this is flow cytometry data. So now we're looking at the expression of cell activation markers. So for example, if we look at B cell activation, you can see that in our control mice right here, versus our SLE1 mice. In our estrogen receptor wild type, we see a significant uh, increase in B cell hyperactivation. Whereas if you look at our knockout mice, it takes it back to the level that was the control. So that again signals that estrogen signaling through estrogen receptor alpha was promoting the loss of tolerance and the B cell hyperactivation that we see. Same thing with T-cell, here's some activation markers for T-cells and looking at the naive T-cell population, same thing. Our uh, control mice that are estrogen receptor alpha show increased T-cell activation. If we remove estrogen receptor signaling, we see a back to normal kind of setup here. So again, this emphasizes that estrogen receptor alpha is playing a role in our immune cell hyperactivation. Lastly, I needed to look at those specific genes. So I did uh, some investigation into looking into Canada genes within the SLE1 interval, looking specifically at some different uh, subloci called SLE1, A, B, and C. And here are some genes that stood out to us. These were known to be associated with immune cell function. So this was the low-hanging fruit, right? Maybe estrogen is just messing up some of these genes at a very... Uh, simple level, and that would be uh, resulting in what we see. Couldn't be that easy. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but the one thing that stood out to us was this one gene called PBX1 in the SLEA interval. And what we see is that PBX1A is more highly expressed in the SLE1 um, mice containing, but that if we remove estrogen signaling, it goes back to what it would be at baseline. So that was something that stood out to us that warranted further investigation, but nothing else stood out too obviously on just that simple gene level. That was the end of my master's. <laughs> so I get to this point and I'm like, man, this is pretty fun. I kind of liked, I kind of liked this work. I was really sucked into it. I loved Karen. She was the most wonderful mentor. She very much was exactly what I wanted to be. So I reached a decision point where I'm like, do I really want to go to med school after all of this? Because I'm pretty sucked into this. 
at the same time I had my first baby. So I was like, do I really want to start medical school at this point? And is that what I see my future career at? So I had a number of factors, but I kept going back to this and saying, research is fun. I like it, but is that all I want my career to be? Is that something I can see myself doing just that for the rest of my career? It was a lot more fun than I thought it would be, but I was still coming back to being stressed about funding. I still felt like I didn't know how to teach, so I wasn't very confident in going to academia and having to teach from there. And I still just wasn't sure if that was where I was going to go from here. So I had a lot of discussions with Karen and said, I like what I'm doing. I want to go into research, but I also want to learn how to teach. I don't know how to teach. I don't know what makes a good teacher from a bad teacher. And so we came together to figure out what's now called the Anatomy Teaching Track Program. So what this is, is combining that basic science research. So my PhD is in genetics and immunology and hormone signaling. But at the same time, I was taking anatomy classes with the medical students and was able to TA. And I was like, I could be an anatomist. That would also be fun. So we combined these programs. So my PhD was a separate um, you know, research component. But creating this teaching track allowed me to learn how to teach gross anatomy, head and neck anatomy, neuroanatomy, embryology, and histology. So I added those class and then learned how to TA them and learned how to teach from the experts, right? From those who have done this for a long time. So this was combining both worlds. I was doing research, but then I was also getting to teach and learn how to teach. So now I transitioned from that master's into a PhD. So the next stage of this then was to better identify how the interplay was occurring between estrogen receptor alpha signaling and this SLE1 interval. How, how is the synergy promoting loss of tolerance, immune cell hyperactivation, and subsequently death? So the next thing that I need to look at was better dissecting that SLE1 interval. So I produced subcongenics. So knowing that we had SLE1A, 1B, and 1C to better you know, more specifically narrow down the interval. Now I needed to cross those with my estrogen receptor alpha knockout mice to see which little interval was more uh, responsible for what we saw in our disease progression. So to summarize, SLE1A was not nearly as penetrant. We do see a sex bias, but it was not significant. And most importantly, the SLE1A interval was affecting primarily the T cell population, which is not something that we saw a sex bias in, and it wasn't as remarkable as what we saw in the B cell hyperactivation. So it's still worth diving into, but not nearly as uh, important, I say, as SLE1B, which was much more highly penetrant in the loss of tolerance, a significant female sex bias, all of kind of the B cell activation and some T cell as well, so it was the shining star and where we were going to go next, looking at estrogen receptor alpha with this B interval. I'm summarizing because we're going to run out of time, but uh, the findings here were that estrogen receptor alpha deficiency abolished that loss of tolerance in our SLE1B female mice with no impact to male. So this led us to believe that it was estrogen receptor alpha that's promoting the female sex bias in SLE1B mice. Okay, I summarized that last part real quick, but take home messages to this. What did I learn from my PhD experience? Number one, focus on who I want to be, not what. I was so set on being a physician because in my mind, that was the way to use science and to help people, but I wasn't really worried about what that meant beyond that. And so I think finding Karen and having her as my mentor very much framed my future direction, and very much led me to focus on being persistent and being a... Uh, rational, methodical researcher and asking questions. I think it was very important in taking me to where I am now. I learned research can be fun. I upgraded from fruit flies to mice, and that was a big thing for me. I mean, I felt real good about that. Time management, not only did my PhD not get dumbed down, my supervisory committee was very much like, there is no PhD light, so you are not doing a light research PhD and teaching for fun. So I had to learn how to manage time. I had to be good with being productive in my time and getting all the things done. Finally, I learned there's so much more to teaching than we teach. And I think that being in that education track really shone light on how to be a good teacher and how to use evidence and use data to support how you are teaching and where, why you are teaching and all of the things. 
Uh, finally, Karen Gould is a saint. She's wonderful. Uh, I was hard. I uh, She didn't have me as much of the time as she should have because she was sharing me with the anatomy program. So um, she was wonderful for dealing with me through all of that. All right, then I had to leave. Graduated. Uh, the best job that was available for an anatomist was at Marquette. So I went to Marquette. At Marquette, I was a clinical assistant professor. I didn't really know what distribution of effort really meant necessarily, but I was 85% teaching, 10% service, which included advising. I was an advisor for students, and 5% research. I went from a PhD research program to 5% research, which was like a shock to the system, right? I had no idea what you do with 5% of your time for research. I did know that I was going to be teaching a lot. So here's all the things that I was teaching, PA, PT students, dental students, undergrad student, grad students, I was thrown into all of these things. But not only was I getting to teach anatomy, I was able to teach physiology, I was able to teach some neurocranial stuff. It was pretty great. I was teaching a lot, but my research went to poop. I had no time for research. So the only option I had really was to continue my work with Karen's lab just from collaboration, right? Giving feedback to those who took over my project and helping to edit manuscripts, etc. Spent a couple of years there and then I got a call from Stan who said, I'm retiring, there's going to be a job posting. If you want to get back home, uh, look into it. At this point I had another kid. <laughs> so. Uh, trying to be two full-time working parents with no family around, uh, I was real eager to get back to Nebraska, to get back to my hometown, and in finding more about the College of Dentistry, I thought this would be a good fit. Getting to use teaching experience, but maybe having a little more time to explore research. So uh, I went back to here. Once I got here, I had to spend a couple of years figuring out what I was doing. Stan taught a lot, and I have now assumed a lot more responsibility with teaching, just the amount of time. So I still needed to figure out how was I going to do research in this setting. Mouse work is time consuming. I don't have time to do that level of mouse work with the teaching load that I have here. So how can I use my research skills to now do something different? So I need to learn what educational research was. I'd never done educational research. I'd never been trained in educational research. So I had to dive into this. We started a, a fun educational research journal club, which COVID kind of squashed, but hopefully we're going to revamp that again. And I think that was helpful to just sit with other people and dive into the literature and say, what does good educational research look like? How do you make good, solid, rigorous data and make it look significant, right? Because oftentimes we think, we kind of discard educational research as not as sciencey, not as legit. So I wanted to learn what good educational research looks like. At the same time, I started making some e-modules. I figured out how to create some nice, helpful tools for the classroom. So I have a nice collection of these now. And I wanted to use those for the educational research. So this started with student projects, which again is a super helpful way for faculty to start some educational or any research projects to get, get something moving. So here's some of the ones that we've been working on. The one that I'm going to talk about today is this one that I've just finished with Allie and Olivia. So for this one, we wanted to use those e-modules, but ask questions about are e-modules effective? Do they do their job or are they just fun? Oftentimes we think of e-modules as fun. It's a fun tool, uh, play around with this thing, but we don't ask questions about how effective they are and if they do the job that we intend them to do. So the gaps in knowledge is that at that time, a lot of the data regarding educational technology or e-modules was all surveys. It was giving students surveys to say, did you like my e-module? Was it fun? Uh, was it a nice review? Which is helpful. It's nice to get student feedback, but that didn't feel substantial to me. That didn't feel like uh, we were getting much out of it. Additionally, there's no control groups in a lot of them. So a lot of times it's here, entire class, take this e-module and see if you do better on a post-test. There's no control group, so you don't know whether it was just reviewing that content that everyone did better or if it was something significant about the e-module that actually helped their understanding. No evidence um, whether it was actually improving their new knowledge or just reinforcing what they already know. And there was no information on whether it impacted their critical thinking. So this started as a project with Alan and Olivia. This is what we just published this last year. And for this, we knew the technology is available. We know we can apply these e-modules, and we know that student engagement is lacking. My traditional lectures are boring. Nobody likes sitting through anatomy lectures. But what if I include some e-modules that are more interactive, more fun, more engaging? That was the goal. We also know that critical thinking skills are 
emphasized in health professional school, right? We want students to think critically. We want them to be actively using their skills. Lectures don't always allow for that, right? So hopefully e-learning can stimulate that same critical thinking that we think we demonstrate in lecture. Previous studies show that, uh, that students prefer e-learning as a supplement. They don't want all of their lectures replaced and not have any lectures or any interaction with the faculty. But can we use it as a supplement? So can we add e-modules into how we're teaching to make them better? So we hypothesize that students that are employing an interactive formative feedback, including e-module designed by content experts, will perform similar to those who are receiving a traditional lecture. So Allie and Olivia got to work, created a nice little bone growth e-module. They chose bone growth because it's something that occurs uh, in a number of classes through their dental training. So bone growth with me, with histology, with, uh, I don't know, pathology, I'm sure, growth and development, orthodontics, all of the things. They have to know bone growth. So they chose that as a topic that they could integrate. They could layer from the baseline, here are bones, here's histology bones, here's pathology, here's implants, here's orthodontics, they could layer it. So it was a nice topic uh, for their choice. They created both the e-module and the traditional lecture, and then we created post pre-test, post-test, and retention tests. Recruited participants, and we selected undergraduate students. I'm going to come back to how terrible that was, but the idea here is that we can't use our own students who are going to be biased, right? They're either going to have previous exposure to this content, which again makes it no control to the scenario, or they're going to be obligated to do it because their professor is making them do it, or they're going to have some like extra credit or something that we don't want to skew our data, right? We don't want other external things. So we thought if we get these very novice learners from undergraduate settings, no prior knowledge, no prior exposure to e-learning, that's our control, right? We hold these sessions where we bring in students, either separate them to do an e-module or sit in a lecture with us, and then have them take a post-test where we can assess their initial learning and then follow up in four weeks and have them do a retention test to see if their, mo their mode of learning impacted how well they retain that information and then we analyze the data. So an important thing that we think about when we think about critical thinking is how do we assess critical thinking? And when we think about tests, as far as written tests, the best way to do it, I think, is to use different levels of questions, right? You can ask first order questions, what cell is this? Or what hormone does this, right? Or you can ask higher order questions. So now when we created our assessments, we included both lower level questions, which is the memorization, the recall, and higher order questions. So here's some example of higher order questions where now they're given a case. They're given a patient case or some kind of, this patient is on all these medications, what are you concerned about? So that's higher order thinking, right? Now they not only have to know the basic information, but they know, have to know how to apply it. So by creating both lower level questions and higher level questions, we can look at their performance on those and say, are they the same on performing higher order thinking? Which to us means critically think. Can they use this basic knowledge that we did, gave them to apply it in a more concept or com complicated manner? So here's all the data. Uh, what we found in general was that students performed equal on their post-tests between our e-module group and our lecture group. To, and that shows that a well-designed e-module can be just as effective at delivering that content and their initial understanding. We also found no difference in their retention tests, which, say, which says that it's not, um, there's no difference in how well they're going to retain that information, whether they had a lecture delivered to them or if they were self-learning with the e-module. Um, this is individual performance, and some of the take-home messages for this is that some students like e-learning and some don't. Some are visual learners and like the interaction. Some just want you to tell them all the things, and that's totally individualized. And the main thing that we emphasize in our conclusions here is that we're not saying replace all of your lectures with e-modules. We're saying that as our curriculum gets denser and there's so much to cover, this is a great way to integrate e-learning and provide it as supplements or extensions or integrative packages for board reviews that they're still going to get the content. They're still going to retain the content and they're still going to be able to critically think with the content. So that was, that was the goal from all of this. Um, I think that's all that I said, but...
Do I need to say anything? Nope, we're good. All right, what did I learn from this process? One, recruiting participants is hard. A lot of these studies, again, are skewed so that if I just took dental students from here, I might be more likely to get them to show up to something, but they're going to be skewed, right? So we wanted this unbiased, uninfluenced um, crew. So we did a whole lot of bribery. Um, we had a student research fellowship, but it didn't allow for much bribery, obviously. That's not included in what's uh, allowed with that money. So I bought a lot of Valentino's pizza. This is pre-COVID, so we were able to bring them in here and feed them. Food usually brings people to the plate. Uh, we spent a lot of our own money to try to get them here, um, mostly just to get our numbers up, because in order to show any significant differences, we needed a good sample size. So that was hard. Um, Allie and Oliver rock stars. I was persistent AF on this project because I really thought it was a good project. And we just had so many failures. Our first session, we only had seven people show up to it. And we're like, what are we going to do with seven people? That's not anything. So we just had to do so many different sessions and try different ways to recruit people. And they just stuck with me through it. So I'm so grateful to have those two on board with this. All right, that's the end of that. Uh, I'm also able, alongside with this educational research that I'm trying to dive into, I'm still continuing some collaborations uh, with the Gould Lab. So here's some of the work we just published last year as far as that continued work with SLE1. So this is to emphasize, even if you're not able to do this kind of mouse work, elaborate work that you want to do, there's still ways to collaborate. So I think even if your time restraints prevent you from pursuing grants and pursuing this kind of work on your own, there's still opportunity for collaboration. And some other projects we're working on, here's a recent one. I just finished with another collaboration. Um, Booby Wynn, who is an anatomist in Texas, she and I created Instagram pages for our classes. If you are one of my students, you might use my Instagram page. Um, but we wanted to get some student feedback about the efficacy of using Instagram, whether students like it, whether it's helpful for board review, et cetera. So that was a paper I uh, could send you if you are so interested. And finally, the upcoming projects that I'm excited about now is I have a couple new students who are taking on my next step to the e-learning process which is can students learning via e-module perform similarly to those learning via traditional lecture on clinical procedure. So now I typically teach trigeminal nerve and I try to add some clinical correlates as far as injections. It is not locally anesthesia course, right? It is not, I'm not a dentist. I can't teach any technique or any details on that, but I still show clinical relevance. Here's why you have to know all these teeny holes, all these teeny branches of nerves. You're gonna care about these some days. So I created an e-module that kind of explores the osteology and does a very superficial overview for dental injections. I had Nagamani do some uh, demonstration on these injections as well, and I had Minnie's help on some of the, um, you know, formation of the palate and whatnot. So it's pretty great. But it's an interactive module where they can drag and drop the needle, do some injections to learn what areas anesthetize, et cetera. So our next step is to bring in some students, have them do the e-module side of things, the lecture side of things, and then we're going to use our simulation mannequins and see how many times they have to poke before they get a ding. So it's pretty, it's pretty simple, right? But it's a way for us to apply how well are they learning those uh, very superficial landmarks and how well will they be able to transfer that into the clinical setting. So here's my end slide. Here's what I learned <laughs> and where I'm at today. Is it lonely? Absolutely not. Uh, what we've seen through all of these seminar series is that we're all in the same boat. Even if our missions, our goals, our focuses are very different, we all have the same things, right? We're all very vulnerable putting ourselves out there to say, I'm going to try this. It's not going to work. Then I'm going to try that. It's not going to work. You can, you can sympathize and empathize with other people. So it's much less lonely than I expected. I isolated a little bit. My office is with the dead people, so I don't see people very often, but I can. If I leave my little area, I can see people. Uh, stress about funding, that's always, I mean, that's the end, so I can't really comment on that. But I now know that an academic researcher can enjoy teaching and can be good at it if they seek opportunities to learn how to be a better teacher and how to apply those skills into different contexts. Uh, I'm still not the smartest person, for sure not in this room, but what I've learned now is that persistence and creativity is what actually matters because there's a lot of smart people that just aren't persistent enough to make 
something into something, right? If you are giving up early on, you're never going to be able to show what you know. So being persistent, being willing to fail over and over again, being vulnerable to feedback and critical uh, feedback from other people, and your creativity and how you take projects and ideas and questions and turn it into something bigger. That's much more important than just being smart. Not monotonous. You can find a whole lot of opportunities if you go looking for it. And are you motivated every day? Absolutely not. There's a lot of days when you're not motivated, but becoming disciplined, becoming a person of habits who knows this is what I need to do next and this is my routine, I will become a researcher. Even if I don't feel like doing research every day, you create habits that ensure that those things get done. All right, I'm sorry that I had so much to say, but that's my background. And for those who only know me as anatomist, hopefully this gives a little background to how I became what I am today.